faith. Um, last week we looked at Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 in the church at Ephesus. And we learned that our love for the Lord can grow cold. The church at Ephesus teaches that we can be busy for the Lord, theologically sound, faithfully serving others, and yet fail to love Jesus as we should. We can leave our first love. You know, one of the things that we need to keep in mind, I think, is that relational maintenance is a constant necessity. Uh, not only for our personal relationships with each other, but especially for our relationship with the Lord. Because that, our relationship to the Lord, is the key to all other relationships. You know, think of it like a relationship is like a, a garden. Uh, they have to be cultivated and weeded on a regular basis so as to really enjoy them. Um, so that was the church at Ephesus. Now today we look at chapter 2, verse number 8, and we're going to consider the church in Smyrna. Chapter 2, verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last, who died and came to life, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray that as um, we enjoy prosperity and peace and relative comfort here in the good old U.S. of A., may we not forget our brothers and sisters in other countries are suffering at this present time. I pray, Father, that we might um, faithfully pray for those whose lives are uncomfortable today. Their lives are threatened. They've been separated from family and prison. They suffer torment. Lord, I pray, give them grace in their suffering. And may their sufferings be uh, fuel for spiritual renewal and revival in those areas, as it is proved in history to be. And the Lord, for us, help us to be willing to pay the price, whatever that might be, whether it be shunned, rejected, defriended. Help us to be willing to suffer for the name of our Savior. And Lord, help us to understand that the trend is headed in that direction. And I pray that may we perceive the hand of God in all of these things. As to what you might be doing in your church. That you might be separating the wheat from the chaff. Even so, Father, for it seems good in your sight. I pray today that our hearts and minds would be open. I pray that we would be challenged from your word to be the kind of Christian you want us to be. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to look at um, the next church. Actually, the seven churches together make up a chiasma. Um, let, me, let me explain that by showing you a slide. If I have... I'll, I'll, I want you to see that um, the way this is broken down is that the first church, Ephesus, and the last church, Laodicea, both kind of have the same problem. They lost their first love, lukewarm, 
okay? And then the second and the sixth church also are much alike in that um, Jesus has nothing bad to say to those churches. To the church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia, which I'm sorry I spelled that wrong, um, but um, the church at Philadelphia and the church at Smyrna, Christ doesn't call them to repentance. He does not have any problem with these churches. As a matter of fact, it's interesting that the two churches, one is the persecuted church and the other is the preaching church. The preaching church is Philadelphia. The persecuted church is Smyrna. To those churches, Jesus had no problem. They received no rebuke. But the center three churches, the church at Pergamon, Thyatira, and Sardis, when you look at those three churches together, they go from bad to worse. They go from um, allowing immorality, idolatry, down to the church at Snar Smart, uh, Sardis, which they were basically a dead church. They have a name, he says, but you're dead. You're dead. That'd be a terrible thing to be said about a church, isn't it? To have a dead church? Well, the church at Sardis was a dead church. We'll talk about that eventually. But you see, there's, a, there's an order to the way John is breaking things down. So if we could go to the map of uh, Turkey, present-day Turkey. Well, this is Asia Minor. And you see, we talked about Ephesus. And now uh, we go 30 miles north to the church at Smyrna. was located in that little um, gulf there on the Aegean Sea. And the persecuted church there, by the way, that, ch you know, Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, gone, does, doesn't ex exist. But there still is a Christian present in Izmir, which is uh, Smyrna now. Izmir is the name of the city today. And um, let me show you a picture of present-day Smyrna. Um, it's a beautiful city on the Aegean Sea. And uh, Jesus had nothing but good to say about this city in the first century when he uh, sent the messenger to it. Alexander the Great made this a model of Greek culture and architecture. Uh, the, uh, the, the hills around it on the Aegean Sea there, um, uh, Alexander the Great kind of made it um, like tiered, a tiered city. And um, the word Smyrna actually is a derivative of the ancient um, spice myrrh that is mentioned several times in the New Testament, associated with suffering. Um, you remember uh, Jesus was on the cross. They offered him some kind of um, anesthetic that um, was, had myrrh in it, and he refused it because he didn't want it, his pain to be dead, and he didn't want to lose his senses. Um, also, later on, um, it says that uh, Joseph of Arimathea brought myrrh to uh, anoint Jesus' body um, for burial, um, back then they would crush the spice and it would give off its aroma and it would actually, uh, they did so to kind of um, mask the stench of death. So, but, but it always seems to be associated with suffering. As a matter of fact, prophetically it was brought to Jesus at his birth. They offered him gold, frankincense, and myrrh and it's a signifying that Jesus was born to die. He was born, he was a going to be the suffering servant. And from the very beginning of Christianity, suffering has been, been uh, woven into the fabric of our faith. I mean, and what a drab and colorless fabric that would be apart from the trials of God's people that they have endured for the last 2,000 years. But the Lord chose this church, this church in Smyrna, I think to be kind of like a cameo of the persecuted church. And just as the spice that's crushed releases its fragrance, so the faithfulness of God's people crushed under the hand of persecution rises to heaven as a sweet aroma before the throne of God. And I want us to think today about uh, being faithful unto death. And let me just ask this question. Ask yourself this question. Does my love for Jesus exceed my fear of man? 
Does my love for Jesus exceed my own fear of death or persecution? So just two things I'd like to focus on today. First of all, the fiery trial of our faith. And to point out that there are actually three sides to uh, persecution, to suffering. Uh, First of all, there is the human aspect, which kind of focuses on the misery of suffering. The uh, human aspect, you know, the word tribulation. uh, Jesus said to the church at Smyrna, I know your tribulation. The word has the idea of being under pressure. Believers in Smyrna were in a pressure cooker of persecution. And there were three types of pressure being brought to bear on these believers. First of all, uh, there was uh, a cultural pressure. You know, um, we, we feel this pressure today, do we not? Um, it's like the pressure to conform. You know, that's what Paul says in the book of Romans. Do not um, let the world push you or crush you into its mold, you know. So we don't want that to happen. Cultural pressure, you know, the Smyrna was a rich city economically. The people enjoyed an affluent lifestyle. Um, They had all kinds of pleasures at their disposal, mostly related to some form of, of paganism. They had lived against a backdrop of hedonism and, and pagan sens- sensuality. I mean, uh, idolatry was everywhere. It was rampant in the city of Smyrna. As a matter of fact, uh, the harbor, you saw that it was, it's kind of like on this harbor. And uh, as it rose on the different tiers, there was this central way that was known as the Golden Way because it was lined with idolatrous temples. Uh, to And by the way, you had to have... Uh, If one of your gods was in that temple, that meant uh, had his own temple, that he was one of the more popular gods. They had so many gods, they couldn't make a temple for all of them. But the more popular gods had a temple right on that main drag uh, going through Smyrna, going up the hill through those tiered buildings. It was just a beautiful thing, and yet it was a pagan thing. But here's the cultural pressure. All, All the Christians had to do to fit in. And to conform is just to put up a temple for Jesus. You know, just put a temple up for Jesus and make a little statue of him and put him in there. And um, alongside maybe Apollos or, or Zeus, uh, Poseidon, Mercury, all, you know, whatever your, whoever your God is. But unfortunately, these Christians in uh, Smyrna were just stubborn and they refused to do that. And they wouldn't play that kind of game. And it was the exclusivity of their faith that really set them apart from everybody else. It didn't matter as long as, okay, well, you got your God. Well, yeah, let me tell you about my God. My, you know, everybody's got their own God. But uh, these Christians would say, well, no, 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 those are not gods. There's only one God. And we won't worship any other God except Jesus. And um, they wouldn't say, well, we're not... We're not just going to add him to all the other gods and worship him as one of those other gods. They took a stand against that. Um, They refused to let the world press them into its mold. You know, which is, that is, I think, the real uh, pressure that we feel here in the United States of America. You should be aware of the fact that um, the world is trying to conform you There are a lot of Christians who are very malleable in that way. They're like the world. The world shapes the way they think, the way they live. You know, and this thing about pluralism, you know, that all religions are equally valid has taken root in America, you know. Uh, You know, it's the idea, okay, look, believe in Jesus, okay, just, okay, believe in Jesus, but just don't tell me he's the only way to heaven because that offends me. Um, well, what they refuse to admit is that their view is no narrower to claim that, you know, Jesus is the only way than to believe that the only way to view religion is to say that all religions are equally valid and that all ways of salvation are equally valid. You know, it's ridiculous because everybody's exclusive just in their own way. 
So they're being kind of hypocritical when they talk about, about that. But this is the kind of pressure the church was experiencing in the city of Smyrna. You know, they said, okay, um, if you got, we would let the pressure off if you guys would just add Jesus to our local deities. And they would not do that. There was also economic pressure. Um, Jesus said, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Now, there are two words that are both translated poor in our English translation. The first word, one of the more commonly used words for being poor in the New Testament, is a Greek word that means you don't have a lot. You know, you're kind of hand to mouth, just scraping by. But then the other word means, uh, has, it's, it's, much, it's much more severe kind of being poor. It's, it's abject poverty. It's, it actually has the idea of being reduced to beggar status. And that is the word that Jesus uses here. He says, I know you guys are under pressure. And he says, I also know that you've been reduced to, you know, you're, you've lost a lot. See, because the reason for this is that every employed person in the city of Smyrna had to belong to a guild. And every guild had their patron deity that they had to pay a certain like union due to, whatever their guild was. And that uh, money was used to support the pagan temple. And all you, uh, you know, if you were back then, your vacation time and your holidays, they all centered around your particular deity. And your worship and festivals would be worshiping that particular god or goddess. But eventually, these believers refused to pay that. It kind of reminds me uh, when I was uh, employed by Sears when I was in college. And I thank the Lord for that job. It helped get me through grad school. And, um, but every year, they would come around. And I won't mention the organization, but they wanted us to donate. And it was expected that you donate to their particular thing. And their, their, their particular organization was supporting things I didn't agree with or believe in. And so I refused to donate. And we would always get hassled about that. Because they did so much good. Why can't you just ignore, you know. It's the same thing. But eventually these people refused to pay tribute. And they faced alienation on the job. Many people, many believers lost their job. And hence Jesus says, look, I know your poverty. I know what this has cost you. And followers of Jesus started to stick out like sore thumbs in Smyrna. And eventually they were boycotted and ended up broke, many of them. You know, this, this is what the world does. If they can't get you to conform um, culturally, if they can't press you into their cultural mode, mold, then they'll try to reach you through your pocketbook. You know, this is what they're, by the way, uh, this is what's happening to the state of Israel, you know. It's happening with the state of Israel with organizations such as uh, BDS, which means boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. Anything from Israel, what they're trying to do is to put the squeeze on Israel's finances. But here's what Jesus says. Look what he says. I know your tribulation and your poverty. And then parenthetically says, but you are rich. And they were. They were rich. And let me just say it right here. If you know Jesus today, you are a wealthy individual. Now, maybe not in terms of your portfolio down at T. Rowe Price. But as far as what's really valuable, eternal riches, you are wealthy in Christ. We have an inheritance, undefiled, incorruptible, reserved in heaven for us, where thieves and, uh, cannot break in and steal and where rust cannot corrode. We have wealth in Jesus Christ. So Jesus reminds them, hey, don't forget, you may have lost your job. You may be poor. You may be hungry and destitute. But just remember, when it, the reality of it is you're wealthy, you're rich. So there was economic pressure. Then there was, uh, there was religious pressure. Look at verse 9. He said, uh, and the slander, he says, now I know your tribulation, you're in this pressure cooker, the world's trying to press you into its mold, and it's, you've also suffered financially, 
because of your stand for Jesus Christ. And then Jesus says, but I also know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, what's this about? Well, there were these false Jewish, um, what's the word, uh, proselytes, if you will, accusing these believers of horrible things. By the way, it was the same old lies. Throughout the Roman Empire, these rumors and lies went around about Christians. First of all, some of these are horrible, but uh, Christians were accused of cannibalism. Um, I mean, some of these lies were horrendous. I, one of them is so bad about the, the body of an infant that I, I won't even mention it, but they would say, you know, because of what the believers taught, about the body and blood of Christ and the, the Lord's Supper, uh, the r- rumors started flying that, uh, around that Christians were uh, cannibalistic. Also that they were incestuous and that, because they would greet one, on, one another with a holy kiss. They called each other brother and sister. And so they were also accused of sexual immorality. And these, um, these Jews, of course, Jews were given a free pass. See, if you were a Jew, they had come to an agreement with the Roman Empire. So as long as they didn't cause any disturbances in the government, um, the Jews didn't have to worship the emperor. They didn't have to worship any deity. They, they didn't have to pay all of these things. And most of them, they could keep their own businesses going because they benefited from the Jewish businesses. So the Jews had kind of worked out a thing. So they, the Jews resented the Christians, and so they're the ones that perpetrated all these horrible horrible rumors about believers. And uh, one of the more uh, common lies that these Jews were spreading about, and by the way, they, he said they're, they, they're supposedly Jews, but they're really not Jews. I mean, they might be a, a real descendant from Abraham, but um, they're not really children of Abraham because he's the father of the faithful. So these were not Jews, and that's what he says, who say they are Jews, but they're not. They're not really Jews. They don't know the true Messiah. So anyway, um, these uh, Jews were saying that the Christians are inciting rebellion against the empire because they would not worship Caesar. Now, let me, let me give you just a brief history lesson about this. Smyrna had become one of the main centers for emperor worship. Now, how did, how did these guys who were Caesar come to be worshipped. Well, uh, there was the goddess of Rome, the Dea Roma. The Dea Roma was the goddess of Rome. And she, uh, as this goddess, they worshipped this goddess that what they felt embodied the spirit of Rome. So they worshipped basically the idea of Rome, the empire, and the goddess of uh, Rome, which they called the Dea Roma. Now, Uh, And by the way, they were enamored with her because she served as a unifying force within the empire Uh, because everybody loved Rome because Rome brought order out of a chaotic world. You know, the great Pax Romana, the Roman peace, uh, they they realized that they had benefited from that. The, uh, The Romans brought stability and order and security to the world. I mean, travel was safe. Roads were built. The sea was made safe again to travel. Uh, Things were better for commerce. The military might of the empire brought a sense of stability and protection to the average citizen. So, hey, the Dea Roma was a good thing. Let's worship the goddess of Rome that represented the idea of everything Rome stands for. But eventually, this concept of a goddess known as the Dea Roma became a little bit too, um, I guess, vague or nebulous for the populace. And so they needed something more tangible. So over time, over the years, the emperor came to embody the spirit of Rome. And hence, well, he became like the Dea Roma or the Dio Roma, the god of Rome. And uh, emperor worship was, became a, it was, here's the best way to think of um, emperor worship. It was a unifying cult for the entire empire. And all you had to do uh, to pay your dues is uh, at certain times you would be asked to come before Caesar's altar and just take a pinch of incense and put it on the coals and let the smoke go up and say, uh, um, Kaiser, 
Caesar, Kaiser Curios. That's all you'd have to do. Put your little pinch of incense on the coals. Smoke goes up. Kaiser Curios. Caesar is Lord. But these Christians, they just didn't want to play that game. Said, we will not do that. And boy, uh, they became a target. They became suspect of, of um, inciting um, riots against Rome. You know, these Jews hurled these accusations of insurrection. Um, it kind of reminds us of what they did before Pontius Pilate, who, you know, they, put this, they used the same tactic on him. If you let this guy go, you're not Caesar's friend. You know, we have no king but Caesar. And so they used this whole thing of emperor worship against the believers. And they would not worship. So there was the religious pressure. There was economic pressure. There was cultural pressure. And so to become a follower of Jesus in the city of Smyrna was putting your reputation, your job, and yes, even your life on the line. So that's the, that's the human aspect of their suffering. But there's also, okay, there's a human aspect to suffering and persecution, but there's also a satanic aspect to persecution. I mean, behind all the slandering these Jews were doing was the ultimate slanderer. And we know who that is, the devil, whose name, Diabolos, means slanderer. And um, he was behind the persecution of believers. He was the one orchestrating these attacks against God's people. And look at verse 10. Um, Jesus says to the church, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and for ten days. You say, what's this ten days? Is this a literal ten days? Well, you know, commentators are not, uh, they don't agree on how to interpret that. Some people want to say, yes, there was a ten-day period of time where there was an all-out program to get rid of Christians there. Uh, I don't know if that's true. Some people uh, say that this 10-day period is, represents a period of time that you can put up with, you know. You know, uh, hey, you can stand anything for 10 days. So that's, you know, you're going to have this period of time, but you'll be able to handle it, uh, this period of persecution. I have no idea. When we get to heaven, you'll have to ask, was that a literal 10-day period, or was it kind of a metaphoric for some, some particular period of time? Um, so he says, be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. Now, uh, one of the great mysteries, you know, if the human aspect emphasizes the misery of persecution. And by the way, I was, I was doing some research on this. And I came across a video on YouTube of a pastor being beaten with a board. Um, and it was difficult to watch. Um, as he was being beaten and blood flowing out of his head onto his face. And um, I didn't understand his language, but he was trying to reason. Obviously, he was trying to reason with them. And, um, you know, it broke my heart. Um, but one of the things that, I, that stuck out to me is that it was painful to him. He felt it. You know, we do, we do hear stories, you know, you can read Fox's Book of Martyrs, and, and I would encourage you to read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you've not read that. Um, oftentimes it seems that believers were like anesthetized to their suffering, that, you know, they'd be burned at the stake and they could sing. Well, I think that did happen. I think God gave many of those first martyrs a special grace. But in the case of this pastor that I watched being beaten, he felt it. And it was horrible and it was painful. So that's the misery of it all. But the mystery of it is that God would allow the devil to attack his children. That's the mystery of it, that God would permit the devil to uh, persecute his people. You know, he, he allowed the devil to take Job's children. He allowed the devil to ruin Job financially, take all of his possessions. He allowed the devil to strike Job's physical body. He was covered with sores, you know. And I, think about this. This is the great mystery that, you know, why would God allow that? Why, you know, when Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Um, he said, Simon, Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. And what that means is that he wants to take all the good out of you and just leave the bad. So Satan wants, you know, Satan, uh, persecution is his test to reveal what's bad about us. But it's God's tool to reveal what's good about us, see. So um, it's interesting, Jesus told Simon, Satan wants to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you. And he says, when you're restored. So he didn't say, I'm going to keep you. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to keep you from being sifted. No, he allowed Peter to be sifted, didn't he? And eventually, Nero would put Peter to death. He said, I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. That's what he prayed. You know, um, there's a satanic aspect in suffering that God will allow. You know, Martin Luther said, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. Which brings us to the last aspect. There's a, yes, there is a satanic aspect to persecution. Satan's behind it. But God allows it. There's a divine aspect also to persecution. And um, God does not waste our suffering. There's purpose in pain. God uses persecution, I think, sometimes to purify His church. Maybe that would be good for the church in the the United States of America. You know, I heard, I I don't know if it's a true story or not, but it was an illustration of um, a, a church that was meeting in China an underground church behind closed doors, and these men burst in with machine guns and said, um, if you don't deny Christ, if, if you will deny Christ, you need to get up and leave. Because if you don't deny Christ, you stay here, and we're going to kill every one of you. And so certain people got up and fled the room. And um, then when all the cowards had left the room, they locked the doors and they took off their mask and said, you know, okay, now we can have church that we've been purified. Interesting story. I, you know, I don't know if that's a true story or not. But I wonder how persecution, uh, what kind of effect it would have on church attendance in the United States. About involvement in service within our churches. God uses persecution, I think, to teach us, to toughen us, to tender us. You know, you who've been through uh, the valley of uh, maybe persecution or suffering, you would probably be able to testify to the ministry of suffering, that God has used it in your life in a particular way. You know, Job maintained his integrity and kept his faith in God, and henceforth, God was glorified. And then think about this. How many millions over these last 2,000 years have been encouraged and strengthened in their faith because of Job's testimony. Think about that. You know, um, in thinking about this, about how, um, you know, God has a purpose in pain, but I also believe God's going to one day write it all. And what is that little chorus where he's saying? It will be what? Worth it all when we see Jesus. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, well, I don't know if that's going to be worth it. You know what you went through. I don't know. Is anything worth that? Losing a loved one or a child or, you know. Well, the old Russian uh, writer Dostoevsky, he helped me tremendously. I came across a quote from him, and I want to read it to you. It's profound. Here's what he said. I believe like a child that suffering will be healed and made up for. That all the humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage. Like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small Euclidean mind of man. That in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass. That it will suffice for all hearts for the comforting of all resentments, for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity and all the blood that they've shed, 
that it will make it not only possible to forgive, but to justify all that has happened. <laughs> and he maybe Dostoevsky didn't know what it was, but I know what it was. It will be worth, worth it all. What is that thing that's going to happen? When we see Jesus, it'll be worth it all. Here's the way, way C.S. Lewis say, said it. They say of some temporal suffering that no future bliss can make up for it. Not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Hallelujah. The fiery trial of our faith will result in praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's talk about that, the final triumph of our faith. Why are we victorious in persecution? Well, um, look first of all at um, how Jesus identifies himself. Verse 8. And remember that every time Jesus starts a letter, he, is to, he describes himself in terms of the vision that was given to John in chapter 1. So in the vision in chapter 1, Jesus identified himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And so here's what he says. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last. So... Isn't that the perfect way we need to think of Jesus, those who are going through persecution? Jesus is the first, first and the last. And when Jesus, uh, you know, think about this. You know, have you ever seen uh, one of the, uh, maybe just a fabrication of one of the old maps, but before the world had been explored, um, they had written on the edges where they didn't know that the end of the world, you know, they didn't know what was beyond that. And on some of the maps, I think this is a historical fact, uh, but uh, on some of the maps, they say things like, here lies demons, or here, here, here are dragons, or they say something about that. It's, it's off the map. They don't know what's out there. Uh, it's the unexplored territory, so to speak. And... Um, when I think about that, you know, I think about when the map of our life is laid out. You think about your, your life as, as a, a, a map, and sometimes you come to uncharted waters. It doesn't say, here lies demon, does it? It says, here lies Christ. Here is Christ. Because I want to tell you something, folks. You may never know the presence of Jesus Christ until you sail through uncharted waters. And you experience the persecution for your faith. I want to tell you, those people, the testimony, um, even in my own life to a certain degree, but especially in the life of the martyrs and in the lives of people, even right now, the testimonies of believers throughout the world, in their suffering for Jesus the presence of Jesus is their comfort. That's the first reason why we're victorious in persecution, because the presence of Jesus is our comfort. Christ's presence is my comfort. Uh, and when we go through those unexplored territories, Jesus comes to us, and the assurance of His presence brings peace. That's why I love Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God. He said, I will be with you. And of course, don't we love Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. There's something about going through those dark valleys and experiencing persecution and when your faith is being attacked that Jesus comes to you in a special way. You know, he said to his disciples in John 4, 14, 18, I love this. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples. And what is John 14? Jesus had just announced he's going to be leaving them. 
He's going to be departing, and they were very upset. That's why Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But then in verse 18 of that same chapter, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. Then he said, I will come to you. And oh boy, I want to tell you, I want to tell you how many believers have testified in their prison or in their torture and in their times of suffering, Jesus came and stood by them. Paul said that. When, nobody, when he was deserted, and remember when he was in prison and he said, Demas has forsaken me. All these people have left me. They've turned their backs on me. But then he says, but the Lord stood with me. He felt the presence of God in his life. So the presence of Christ is our comfort. Secondly, Christ's power is our courage. Look at what it says. Um, the words of the first and the last. Now this is, almost sounds contradictory, doesn't it? The, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Now when Jesus says, when Jesus said, I am the first and the last, you know what he's doing there, don't you? He is claiming Godhood. To be the first and the last is to be God. To be before anything else and to outlast everything else is to be God. And he, look, for example, let's, let's take a moment. Would you take your Bibles and go to uh, Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. Um, show you a couple of verses. And I, and I really believe that this is something that, that uh, Jesus is kind of quoting here. Look at verse 4. Isaiah 41 4. He's talking about this is God speaking. Who has performed and done this? Calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord. Do you, do you see the Lord there in your translations is capitals, all caps? You know what that tells you in your English version when you see Lord in all capitals? That is not lowercase Lord for master. It is all uppercase meaning Yahweh, Jehovah. So, I, Jehovah, the first and with the last, I am He. Flip over to chapter, Isaiah 44. Look at chapter 44. Look at... Uh, hmm. We'll go back. Look at chapter 43 even. Look at chapter 43, verse 10. God says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. And my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Now look at chapter 44, verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Beside me there is no God. Flip over to chapter 48. Chapter 48, look at verse 12. Here is the Lord calling to His people Israel. Isaiah 48, 12. Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I called. I am He, I am the first, and I am the last. So here's what I'm saying. When Jesus identifies Himself to these suffering believers in Smyrna, He's claiming Godhood. I am God. But then he goes, this is what blows your mind. Then he says, I'm also the one who died and came back to life. How does God die? You just claim to be God. And now you're saying you died. How does God die? He died in the person of Jesus Christ. God took on flesh. And he died in our place on the cross. And so this is a reminder of who Jesus is to these people, that He is fully God, and yet He was, he was uh, the same one who died and rose again from the dead because death has no power over Him. You know, there was a pastor in Smyrna, Polycarp. Polycarp was a pastor in the city of Smyrna who was arrested, 
And you can, by the way, you can read his story. If you, want to, if you don't have a copy of it, you should get a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And one of the first stories you will read about is the story of the Bishop of Smyrna, or the pastor of Smyrna, which is Polycarp. Uh, so he was arrested and taken before the governor, and he was ordered in front of a crowd to take that pinch of incense and put it on the altar to Caesar. He would not do it. And uh, the governor said to him, do it and I will set you free. This is from Fox's Book of Martyrs. And Polycarp responded, 80 and six years have I served him. How could I blaspheme my Lord and Savior? Do it or I will cast you to the wild beast, said the governor. And then here's what, here's what, a paraphrase of what Polycarp said. Well, perhaps you didn't hear me. I am a Christian. The governor responded, do it or you will be burned alive. Polycarp said, this fire may burn for an hour, but you are ignorant of the fire of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. So bring forth what you will. So they burned him at the stake. But if you read the story, you read the, whether or not this happened. I don't know if it happened or not. But as he was tied to the stake and they set fire to all of the, the wood underneath him, the fire actually circled him and would not burn him at first. Now, I don't know how much of that has been embellished over the years. But he finally, his body began to burn in the flames, and he was heard to say this, his last words, Lord, I thank you that you have considered me worthy of this day and hour, that I may receive a portion in the number of your martyrs and the cup of Christ. I mean, Christ's power is our courage. So here's what I'm saying. If any of you at some point in your life is faced with a test of your faith by suffering some kind of cost for your faith, be it at work, in the neighborhood, I don't care where, among your family, and I, I know Christians that have kind of suffered at the hands of their family for their faith. The man that led me to Christ was disowned by his family for becoming a Christian. So, just remember, Christ's power will fill you and enable you to be strong in the midst of that persecution. His presence comforts us. His power strengthens us. And then last of all, His promises are our confidence. Boy, I tell you what, there are a lot of great promises for believers to, man, more than enough to hang your faith on, I'm telling you. Um, let, me, let me just read you what Paul wrote to the Romans. And I'm, I'm gonna, I'll read this from the uh, New Living Translation because I think it's, it's kind of cool the way they say it. Uh, Romans 8, 35 through 39. It's, it's kind of long, but just listen to what the Bible says here from the New Living Translation. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the Scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from His love. Death cannot. And life cannot. The angels can't. Demons can't. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, even the powers of hell cannot keep God's love away. Whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul wrote to the Roman believers, For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Let me just say it like this. There are some things worse than dying, folks. You know, here in America, we're so programmed for comfort, we, we can't help ourselves. Uh, we don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to be ridiculed or rejected. Uh, we don't want to be excluded. Um, but know this. To some degree... I'm just saying what the Bible says. To some degree, 
all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution to some degree. If you and I are the believers God wants us to be in this world, it's going to result in some kind of cost. Faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear the glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith. We will be true to thee till death. Our fathers chained in prisons dark were still in heart and conscience free. Then notice what it says next. How sweet would be their children's fate if they, like them, should die for thee. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. You know, I don't know if you subscribe to World Magazine. Coincidence, I guess. I didn't, I didn't know this was coming this week, but um, um, the, uh, the whole theme of this um, edition of World Magazine is lifting high the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's about believers suffering in the Middle East for their faith. And the particular article uh, represented by the front cover is about Syrians, our brothers and sisters in Syrians. So, you know, um, let, me, let me just read you just a little excerpt. Four years ago, February 23, 2015, ISIS militants overran 30 villages that made up this valley, this particular valley, and there's pictures of it and the people there. Um, they bombed and destroyed 12 churches, multi multiple homes and structures like the water tower. They took down the, the village, the, the, their water tower. The fighters kidnapped more than 250 Christians and drove away thousands of residents. Seven months later, they dressed three captured residents from the, the villages in orange jumpsuits and videotaped their execution. Not long ago, the article says, not long ago there were 20,000 20, Assyrian Christians living in this valley. Just in that one little valley, there were, there were 20,000 believers. Um, and it says... The, the church of the East Bishop of Syria has announced, now we have less than 800. In three years, from 20,000 to 800. And then, um, just to show you how the Lord works, um, there, there was, there's another article about the soils of suffering. And this is about the church in Cambodia. Now, many of us are old enough to remember the Khmer Rouge and the killing fields of Pol Pot. Many of you remember those. How half a million people were slaughtered and murdered. Uh, but now, it's amazing. Um, just, just a couple things from the article that I thought were interesting. Uh, now, in Cambodia, with more than 2,000 congregants each week, the New Life Fellowship is one of the largest churches in Cambodia. Churches of this size in Phnom Penh would have been unthinkable 30 years ago when Christians had to meet secretly in homes. They could be arrested for having a Bible. Today, churches of all sizes, uh, mega churches, 100-member churches, smaller cell groups meet every Sunday mornings all over the country. Um, then it goes on down. It says, uh, miraculously, the aftermath of the Khmer Rouge opened the door for Christianity to permeate the Buddhist country, the number of Cambodian Christians has increased from likely only a few hundred believers in 1979 to 470,000 in 2010, 3% of the population. Today, Christians worship and evangelize freely with the promise of Hun Sen, he's one of the, the president, saying that they won't face persecution as long as they stay out of politics and don't... But then, let, you know, it's, it really is an interesting article, but let me go to the very, um, it talks about this guy, Saying, who uh, was just a child growing up in a Buddhist family. Now, get this. We have the, uh, the privilege of supporting, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the Brunsons. Are they with Transworld Radio? 
I'm not going to get emotional. Okay. <laughs> this guy, Saying, was brought up in a Buddhist family, and they were undergoing uh, persecution when he was, he, he doesn't even remember most of it. And um, their father, he said, uh, during the horror of the Khmer Rouge, his father remembered the gospel message he had heard from a relative. Afterward, he told his children that they were a Christian family and would not worship in Buddhist temples like their neighbors. Saying and his siblings didn't know what it meant to be a Christian. But one day, I told you I wasn't going to get emotional. Somebody gave him a little radio. And they heard the gospel via radio. Now this guy is a pastor. And here, here, listen to what the last, here's how the article finishes. Saying has high hopes for his four children who range in age from 6 to 15. He believes they can achieve great things, freed from the emotional baggage carried by previous generations. There are a lot of people, the article explains this, that what they went through under the Kimber Rouge was just unspeakable, and it scarred and messed up so many people. Um, for them, the story of what their father endured under the Kimber Rouge seems far removed from the current reality. They can't believe people would do that to each other, he explains. Still, through all he has experienced, Saing, now here's, here's the point, Saing sees God's hand in Cambodia's history. Why did God allow the Khmer Rouge to happen, he asked. Quote, we lost a lot of lives. I lost family members, so I don't want to say it was a good thing. Yet, Saying believes the atrocity shook his countrymen from spiritual complacency. And here's what he said, quote, After the Khmer Rouge, everything flipped upside down. People were seeking new hope, new opportunity, so we were open to the gospel. If we look at the spiritual side, the Khmer Rouge was an opportunity to open the hearts of the Cambodian people. What do you know? God knows what he's doing after all. So what do we do? I would say three things in closing will be done. Number one, would you pray for those people? Hebrews chapter 13, remember them who are in bonds is bound with them. Our brothers and sisters in your devotions as the Holy Spirit brings them to mind. There's a reason why the Holy Spirit brings. Listen, there have been times I thought, oh, I haven't even been thinking about that. Boom. And what you have to, when the Holy Spirit brings to mind, stop. Whatever you're doing, pray for your brothers and sisters suffering. God has ordained prayer as a means for Him to work. So pray. Uh, secondly, preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. No matter what it costs, preach the gospel no matter what. You know, this morning in our, our Sunday school lesson, it happened, which just happened to be about Paul's imprisonment furthering the gospel, uh, it related a story that I, that I looked up, Richard Wormbrand. Now, you might not know Richard Wormbrand, but uh, he was a Romanian, Romanian uh, pastor who uh, the communists imprisoned and tortured for Christ because he would not deny his faith. He would not deny the Lord. So they put him in prison and they beat him badly. And uh, as a matter of fact, I found this little part of his testimony. Here's what he said in his book, Tortured for Christ. Here's a little excerpt. He says, it was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted their terms. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. <laughs> Oh, yet I have to ask myself, do I love Jesus that much? And yet we fear being slighted. <laughs> preach the gospel, pray for those, preach the gospel, and then prepare for Jesus' return. Because th there's nothing like persecution that lifts our eyes heavenward. And we need to remember that this, this is not all there is, this we're just, this is just the pregame warm-up, folks. We're just in the dress rehearsal. Jesus is coming. The real deal is going to happen. And I like what Johnny Erickson Tata said. Let's not get too settled in. 
too satisfied with good things down here on earth. They are only the tinkling sounds of the orchestra warming up. The real song is about to break into a heavenly symphony and its prelude is only a few moments away. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And I do, I believe that with all my heart, that the moment, the instant we see Him, everything that we thought was unfair, everything we thought was horrible, all of the atrocities of life and the horrible things that uh, have stained like a horrible blot on the course of history, all those things will make perfect sense in the light of His glory and grace. Let us stand together. Do you know Jesus today? I think uh, for many of us, uh, we've counted the cost, but maybe it's time we start paying the price. What have you not done for Jesus because you feared the consequences? Seriously. What is your love for Jesus in terms of what you're willing to risk for Him? Perhaps you're here today and you don't know Jesus. Folks, I want to tell you, not only is He worth dying for, we need to focus right now, He's also worth living for. I mean, hey, you say you're willing to die for Jesus. Well, just first of all, just settle down and, and live for him. Live to make him known. To know him and make him known. Lord, I, I pray that um, you'd help us in our witness. Help us, Lord, to... Um, be bold, to be bold as lions. Lord, help us to be willing to pay the price no matter what it is, no matter what it is, to take our stand for truth. And I believe the days are coming when there's going to be a very, very definite price tag to live for Jesus, to speak out for Jesus. God, give us the courage to do that. In Jesus' name. Uh, before we close, there's one thing that I...